Good morning to you, Mr. President. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Angelie. Great to You're be welcome. with you. Great to have you here. We watched the press conference yesterday at the Rose Garden, and you announced to extend this pause until the end of the month. You also said you think the peak is going to be in about two more weeks. Do we have enough equipment to handle that peak? Well, we should. I mean, we're delivering so much equipment, uh, nobody's ever seen anything like it. It's a war. We're fighting a war. And the federal government has really stepped up, and most governors are very happy. I get on calls, and I get on a lot of the governor calls. Where we'll have all 50 governors plus, where we have some territories also. But we have 50 governors. And I'll tell you what, if you could listen to those calls, you'd never hear a complaint. Then sometimes the news will say, we've got information, and they have no information at all. But, you know, they try, uh, they try and build uh, wars between people. But, no, uh, we have a great relationship with the governors uh, because of what we're doing. We started off with an empty shelf. There was a... Uh, not a lot. Just like we had no ammunition when the general walked in and he said, sir, we have no ammunition in my first week. Uh, well, we didn't have uh, very much in terms of medical product either. And we built something really good. Now uh, we have on store, and as we need them, we have 10,000 ventilators. We have uh, massive plane loads of things coming in. You know, we have 51 planes. You saw that UPS and FedEx yesterday. Uh, we have 51 planes coming up, loaded up with material from all over, and now we're doing really well. I mean, it was uh, it, it's tough stuff. This is a tough deal, but uh, it's incredible. Today we're opening yeah. up a hospital, 2,900 beds in New York City, and uh, we, in addition to that, we're doing four medical centers in New York City. We're doing New Jersey. We're doing Louisiana. We're doing Florida. We have all over the country. We're doing things. It's incredible what uh, what's happened with the Army Corps of Engineers and FEMA. Mr. President, today was going to be uh, the 15th day of 15 days to slow the spread. And today was the day you were going to make the determination uh, on, on how to open up America again, because I know you want to get America back to business. But what have you seen over the last 48 hours that uh, had you reassess that strategy and say, you know what, I think we need to take a month off? Well, it's not so much what I've seen. I listen to experts. We have Dr. Fauci. We have, uh, as you know, we have Deborah Burks, who's fantastic also, Dr. Deborah Burks, and the two of them, plus many people behind them. And the worst that can happen is you do it too early, and all of a sudden it comes back. That makes it more difficult. So we're, we're doing a, a great job. New York is really in trouble, but I think it's going to end up being fine. We're loading it up. We're stocking it up, both New York City and state. We're dealing with the mayor. We're dealing with the governor. And the relationships are very good. I mean, you hear it. They would be complaining if it wasn't. So we're getting them a lot of things that they never thought they'd be getting, including hospitals. We're building hospitals for them. And we're building them in three and four days. They're mobile hospitals, but they're very complex and very big. And when you have 2,900 right. beds, that's a big hospital. So we're doing a lot of things, and we don't want to do it too soon. But it's... You know, we're thinking that uh, around Easter, that's going to be your spike. That's going to be the highest point, we think. And then it's going to start coming down from there. That will be a day of celebration. And we just want to do it right. So we picked the end of April, uh, the last day, April 30th, as a day where we can see some real progress. And we, we expect to see that. And then by a little short of June, maybe June 1st, uh, we think the... Uh, you know, it's a terrible thing to say, but we think the death will be at a very low number. It'll be brought down to a very low number from right now, from where it's uh, getting to reach its peak. Uh, Mr. President, yesterday you, you spoke for 90 minutes. You took, uh, when you go out there, you take uh, endless amounts of questions. And the one thing I think a lot of people are telling me over the weekend is it's kind of heartening to see Democrats and Republicans getting along in some cases, like you with Governor Cuomo. We watch your uh, presser. We watch his presser on a daily basis. We get a lot of news. One thing I didn't hear you address, and if you did, I'm sorry if I missed it, but he talks about immunity tests. He talks about giving people in New York an immunity test. And then ha and Germany seems to be doing the same thing, where if you had it and you got rid of it, you're immune to it, perhaps, and you can go to work. When you go to work, maybe they take your temperature like they do when you go to give blood. Even if you work to go to give blood, they take your temperature before right. you walk in the building. Can you see right. this being the way to normalcy? Well, I can. I think it's going to be a big help, and we're very close. As you know, you probably listened, because I talked about it yesterday. 
uh, where they're refining the final steps and they're having some tremendous success. And they're also, you know, we have a lot of things happening right now. As you know, the hydroxychloroquine, which is a, a malaria drug and also an arthritis drug, but it's a, primarily a malaria drug, very powerful drug. And we're going to we're going to know within days. You know, we, we're testing that as an example, Brian, which is going to be very exciting if something positive comes of it. But that's being tested very strongly in New York. We have 1,100 people on that drug together with ZPAC. And, uh, you know, the ZPAC, you know what that is. And uh, so I think we have a lot of interesting things happening. The, the uh, labs, uh, you see Abbott came up with a, a test where you can literally, I mean, it's uh, in minutes you see whether or not you have the problem, and that's something that nobody thought could happen. And they came out of it's a great, great company, great laboratories, and they came up with something that is nobody was even thinking about two weeks ago or five weeks ago. So that's going to make a big impact. And yet, you know, we've tested more than any other country. We inherited a broken test. Yeah. The whole thing was broken, and we rebuilt it. And you know, this I wish it was done before. And I'm not even blaming anybody. Nobody could have predicted something like this. But we're now testing hundreds of thousands of people. We've tested more than anybody in the world by far. When you look at South Korea, we'll do more in eight days than they do in eight weeks. And that's not a knock on them. Plus, our test is a better test. It's a very sophisticated test. And we so we've tested more, and that's why we have more cases. Because if you look at some of the countries with one and a half billion people, whether it's India, China, or others, I mean, they have they have very big countries. But we test more than anybody else, so we will show, we will find people that have it that don't even know they're sick in some cases. So we have more cases than anybody, but we're doing really well, and we also have a very low, relative to other countries, very low mortality rate, and there are reasons for that. Mr. President, we had Dr. Oz on our show earlier, and we were asking him, hey, we said the president's coming on. Are there any questions that you have for him after you watched the press conference yesterday? This is what he had to say. How long until when a patient comes to the hospital and we get a test on them, we can get a result back within 24 hours? Forget about five minutes or 15 minutes or 45 minutes. I know those tests are coming out, but we just need to be able to get the results back within a day. It would help tremendously. Can you respond to that, Mr. President? Well, he's, uh, he's 100 percent right, because sometimes it's two or three days. Now it's getting down to a day. We think it would be less than that. But when this new test comes out, we'll be able to give it, you know, as they sit. We literally will be able to give it. We'll know exactly what's happening. And it's a very sophisticated result, too. It's not – it could be even a step better than what we're having. And what we do, you know, that's a rough test. That's a pretty rough test. I took it, and I will tell you. There's nothing pleasant about it. But the new test is easier, simpler, and quick. You're going to know your answer right away. So that's what we're looking for. That's coming out very soon, like almost immediately. That's this right. week? You know, uh, Mr. President, today is Monday, this March week. It could 30th. be this week, yes. Uh, right. Coming up on... Okay. Uh, today is um, March 30th. Coming up on Wednesday, it's going to be April 1st. And this really is a make-or-break uh, week, Mr. President, because, you know, a lot of uh, businesses are going to have to say, okay, uh, the rent is due. Uh, can do, am I going to be able to pay the rent? Am I going to have to talk to the landlord? Who am I going to have to lay off? Who am I going to be able to keep? Because this is such a make or break week for the people looking in. I know yesterday you were talking about the importance of we're going to get through this all together. But there are a lot of people who are worried about their finances right now. Well, I agree, and uh, nobody more worried than me for the whole country. And look, a thing like this has never happened. So we have the best economy in the history of our country by far. We've had the best employment numbers we've ever had with African Americans, Asian Americans, with uh, Hispanic Americans, everybody. The best you've heard it a hundred times. We had the best we've ever had. And then one day they said, by the way, there's a virus coming in, and everyone's saying, what's that all about? And in one day, we had to shut it down. And by the way, you, I don't know if you saw yesterday, but the question I've been asking, a lot of people have been asking, if we didn't shut it down, because I used to say a lot of people said, well, could you just have kept it going, you know, like the flu, like a bad case of the flu, a really bad case. And the answer came in yesterday through Dr. Fauci and th through Deborah Burks. The answer came in, if 
we did that. In other words, if we just kept the business as usual and didn't do anything to stop it or impede it, uh, could could have been 2.2 million people could have died. 2.2 million people uh -huh. uh, would have been between 1.6. They say. Right. I mean, they showed you the the numbers. 1.6 and 2.2 million people. It could have been more than that. So, you know, that's when you realize that what we did last week with the uh, two trillion dollar bill was was very worth it. But if you got anywhere near a number like that, now we're trying to keep. You know, I, I say we want to do something where we have the least death. And that's what we're doing. And uh, the, the people of this country have been incredible with social distancing and everything else they're doing. I mean, they've been incredible. Some of them, you know, I'm getting letters from people that have found my family again. You know, they were doing all sorts of things, and now they're, they're with their family in the home, and they're not going out, and a lot of things are happening. And they're, they're writing me. Right. We're getting actually a lot of letters. We found our family again. We found what life should be. So, you know, a lot of things are happening. But, no, the people of our country have been incredible. This is in 151 countries as of this morning. I mean, who would think of that? 151 countries. It's oh, yeah. all over the world, and it's, uh, it's a very sad thing. It's a very vicious thing. But if we didn't do anything, could have been 2.2 million people could have died. That's a lot. Right. Mr. President, as I mentioned earlier, I remember when uh, Bush 41 and uh, when Bush 43 asked Bush 41 and Clinton to get together, I think after some catastrophes, people were heartened by it. They saw Democrats and Republicans working together. When they see you and Cuomo uh, working together, I think people are heartened by it. But then when you see Speaker Pelosi come out and say, President Trump's denial at the beginning of this was deadly, as the president fiddles, people are dying. What's your reaction to that? Well, you know, it's a sad thing. Look, she's a uh, sick puppy, in my opinion. She really is. She's got a lot of problems, and that's a horrible thing to say, especially when I was the one. And, you know, I've gotten from fair people, uh, you know, a lot of accolades, and I don't want the accolades, but it, it's just in terms of a fact. Uh, when I stopped all very, some very, very infected, very, very sick people, thousands coming in from China long earlier than anybody thought, including the experts, nobody thought we should do it except me. And I stopped everybody. We stopped it cold. It had never been done before in the history of our country. And Dr. Fauci said the other day, if those people came in, if, they, if I didn't do that, you would have had uh, deaths uh, like you right. have never seen before. And, you know, she doesn't mention that. And that was early. And don't forget, she was playing the impeachment game, you know, her game where she ended up looking like a fool. She was doing nothing. But all she did for the first long time was impeach. Impeach. This went on for uh, years. I mean, if you think about it, that's all she did. She didn't do anything. She couldn't get bills passed. She's controlled by the radical left, by AOC plus three. And, uh, you know, to, for her to make a statement like that, I saw that. I thought it was a disgrace. I think it's a disgrace to her country, her family. I think it's, it shouldn't be. And I guess now when she says, oh, I pray for the president, I pray for the president so much. Well, I, I don't think that's true. What a statement to make. What a horrible statement to make. Lindsey Graham was asked about it, and he said, he said, she's one to talk. This is not fair for her to say that. She was fiddling by delaying the stimulus package. But I want to ask you on that note about working with Democrats and Republicans. You're saying we've got this 3,000-bed hospital at the Javits Center that's opening up. The Navy ship Comfort is arriving today. You mentioned the four medical centers that are here in New York where the epicenter is. How much of this is, is you, is the federal government, and how are you working with governors? What responsibility do they have? We interviewed Ron DeSantis earlier, and he said that he doesn't expect you to do his job for him. Well, if you look, I mean, you know, the ships are us. When you say me, I'm talking about the federal government, and the ships are us, they, and you have one in Los Angeles, too. And by the way, Gavin Newsom, the gover governor, has been very nice, and we've had our disputes on the forest fires and the borders and a lot of other things, but Gavin Newsom has been fantastic in his praise for what we've all done. No, the federal government has done far more than if anybody else was president. I mean, if Sleepy Joe was president, he wouldn't even know what's going on. You know that. I mean, everybody knows that. We have taken this thing and done a hell of a job. And like in Ohio yesterday, we got a sterilization for the mask machine approved. Uh, it was stuck in FDA. I called up uh, Dr. Hahn of FDA. He's a terrific guy, highly successful. He came here recently. We got it done in one night. We got it approved. It sterilizes masks. I've always wondered, these very expensive masks, 
They just throw them away. And I said, why wouldn't they be sterilized? Well, they have equipment to make these. They can sterilize them up to 20 times. So think of the savings. Think of the and, and, and the immediacy of it. So uh, we've done a tremendous yeah. amount. We've done. I, I cannot imagine any president being able to do more than we've done. And again, I started with empty shelves because the supply line was not there. The supply line wasn't built. And what we've done with FEMA and what we've done with the Army Corps of Engineers and General Seminite and, I mean, to throw up a hospital, 2,900 beds in three days. And this is a sophisticated hospital. This is not like nothing. This is not a couple of tents. This is, a, a you know, an amazing thing. And we've been given a lot, but we've also, then you hear Nancy Pelosi, who's, you know, somehow there's something wrong with the woman, because she knows what we've done. And then you look at San Francisco, how her how her area where she lives has become like a a slum. It's a slum, and she should focus on that. Of course, she lives in a beautiful house over the ocean, but her area that she's in charge of has become, from being one of the best in the whole country, has become a slum. And they don't do anything about it. They leave it there. In fact, the federal government may we may get involved and take over that area and clean it up. And the homeless are are being. I mean, everybody, it's such a bad, it's such a mess, it's so bad, and yet she'll sit there and complain. All she did was focus on impeachment. She didn't focus on anything having to do with pandemics. She didn't focus on that. She focused on impeachment, and she lost, and she looked like a fool. And frankly, it unified our party. And, you know, I have to say this, it's never pleasant, but my poll numbers are the highest they've ever been because of her. So we'll see how it all turns out. But she should she should never say a thing like she said. Well, uh, Mr. President, one of the one area of criticism toward the administration and the federal government generally is the fact that, uh, you know, you've got governors like uh, Governor Cuomo calling for more ventilators. It was announced, I, th I think, in the last 12 hours or so that GM will be producing 10,000 ventilators per month by the by summer. Uh, it, but, of course, you really had to hold their feet to the fire by invoking the Defense Production Act. Why did you wind up doing that? Because it sounded like for the longest time, behind the scenes, things were going great until they weren't. Well, no, I've been using it a lot to talk to people. They know I have it. It's great leverage. It's great. You know, we don't want to be nationalizing our country. We don't want to be taking over. It's a terrible symbol to say. And I tell you, I used it with respect to General Motors. And they've been great since then. They've been great. You know, they were not doing what we thought they should be doing, and we were not getting along, and all of a sudden we got along great. I have two other companies that have become come great once I told them we're going to use it, you know, and they've been doing a great job. Now, we've, we've been doing a great job. You know, don't forget, a ventilator, that's like an automobile. It's a very complicated machinery. It's very expensive. They can cost anywhere from 5000 to $30,000. You know, you have very different machines. You have some extremely complicated and and sophisticated, and you have others that are simpler. But you're talking about from five to $30,000. It's very expensive and very complex. And we delivered 4,000 ventilators to New York, to their warehouse, which happens to be located, which is interesting, in Edison, New Jersey. Uh, it was signed off, they were delivered, and they weren't used. And we said a number of days later, why aren't you using these ventilators? I don't know what happened, but we delivered thousands of them, and we've delivered them to a lot of people. You know, there's a whole question about that. I think New York should be fine. Based on the numbers that we see, they should have more than enough. I mean, I, I'm hearing stories that they're not used or they're not used right. But when we find anywhere from two to 4,000 that have been sent and aren't used, uh, you know, we've done a job. Now, we're still getting more ventilators. We're going to have, after this is over, we'll be selling, they'll be selling ventilators for a uh, dollar a piece. We'll have a lot of them. But, you know, they have to build them because, for the most part, the whole world is short on ventilators. And, you know, I spoke to Boris Johnson, the prime minister of UK, and he the first thing he said to me is, we need ventilators. He was uh, tested, as you know, positive, which is very bad. And he's a friend of mine. He's a great guy. And I spoke to him like, to call him to say hello. And he said, uh, Donald, we need ventilators. That's the UK. Uh, Italy needs ventilators. Spain needs ventilators. And they're being hit really hard, the, those two countries. But they need ventilators. And we're making a lot of ventilators now, but they're being made. And eventually, it'll, you know, be... There'll be a dime a dozen, but 
right now, you know, the uh, New York had a chance to get 16,000 ventilators a few years ago, and they turned it down. They should be getting it. You know, the states should be getting it. We should be a backup. And we've become not a backup, the opposite. The other thing we're right. doing is we're sending things directly. We're not sending it to our big storage areas and then pick it up from there. I'm saying go directly. Send it directly where they need it. Don't bring it into our factories, our plants. Bring it in directly into the site, the hospital, or wherever it's going. And that's for ventilators and other things. So I just have uh, something to report, I'm sure you know, but it looks like Benjamin Netanyahu, because he came in contact with someone who tested positive, looks like he's going into quarantine for, I imagine, if the protocol's the same in Israel for a couple of weeks, so I'll watch that. Which brings me to the international stage, and I'm just wondering, uh, it turns out, uh, according to the Washington Post, Russia, Iran, and China are going through a sophisticated disinformation campaign, essentially blaming us around the world for our, our bad response and for actually causing the virus, using the same principles they use uh, to infiltrate our 2016 election. We're the best at this. How long are we going to let these countries get away with that? And do we have a counter strategy like the truth to tell the rest of the world? Number one, you don't know what they're doing. And when you read it in the Washington Post, you don't believe it. I don't. I believe very little what I see. I, I see stories in the Washington Post that are so well, fake, that are it. so phony. Yeah. I have stories that are <laughs> such fake stuff. Uh, that's number but one. Mr. President, you know so China, I'd but you know China's see. already done this. Uh, they do it, and we do it, and we call them different things. And, you know, I make statements that are very strong against China including the Chinese virus, which has been going on for a long time. I mean, I wouldn't say they were thrilled with that statement when they said our soldiers did it. They said our soldiers did it. I said, you mean the Chinese that's virus? That's what I'm talking about. And all of a sudden yeah, they call well, and they the, say, let's talk, right. let's talk nicely. Yeah, sure, that's, hey, every country does it, but they build it up and to some, we, we handle that, and they probably handle it, but countries do that, and... Uh, but when I read things in the Washington Post, I mean, I could tell you stories that they write that are just the opposite. They will do anything they can to hurt this presidency. And yet here we are with the best numbers we've ever had. I don't even understand it when you can get such fake news from so many. New York Times is a totally dishonest paper. They're dishonest people. Washington Post, same thing. I'm trying to figure out for three and a half years who is more dishonest, who is more corrupt, the Washington Post or the New York Times. When I figure it out, I'll let you know. We'll have a special. Mr. President, you said we we're going to give it 15 days. That's today. Then you said uh, Easter, and then you said yesterday that was aspirational. Now you're saying uh, the end of this month. If the, if the physicians, if the experts, if your task force says at the end of the month, hey, we need to continue to do this, we need to continue to, ta to take a pause into the next month, what will your response be? Well, I'll use my head and I'll make a decision, but I'm going to rely on experts. I do that. You know, that's what they do. They've been doing it. Anthony and Deborah have been doing this for many years, and uh, I'm going to rely on them. But, uh, you know, I think that, uh, hey, the worst thing we can do is declare victory. We've seen this. Declare victory and then not have victory and then have to do it all over again. We have to get this thing gone, this virus. We have to beat it. It's, we're at war. This is a war. I say it all the time, the invisible enemy, which is true. We are in war with, with a horrible scourge, a horrible thing, and we're going to win it. And we're getting close to winning it. We're getting close. The people of this country have been incredible. Now, New York has a, has a big thing going. They're a hot spot. Louisiana, which was really not touched until recently, and then all of a sudden it blew up, and that's a hot spot. And we have some hot spots. Parts of New Jersey have been dealing with Governor Murphy, and he's terrific. I mean, he's, we really have a very good relationship. He's a Democrat. I'm a Republican. I mean, I get along with many of them and because I'm doing a good job. They wouldn't be getting along with me if I wasn't producing. We're building hospitals for people, for governors all over the country. Yeah. Look, you just, mentioned, uh, you just mentioned California. You know, we have a ship moving there, too. We just, in fact, it's already opened. And you have a great scene today. You'll have uh, the beautiful ship coming up. The Comfort coming up from uh, Virginia three and a half weeks early. It was going to be up there in four weeks, and it's now uh, it's coming up today. Yeah. And I imagine the governor will greet it. But that's all done by us. That's done by the federal. It's fully stocked. It's got great doctors and nurses and everything on it. I mean, it's, uh, it's a beautiful sight. I was there when they sent it out. Mm -hmm. But they sent it out three and a half, four weeks early. 
Yep, we saw that live on the Fox News Channel the other day. Uh, Mr. President, you just mentioned the governor of New York. That, that of course, uh, Andrew Cuomo. There's been some speculation that because he's handling the coronavirus uh, threat here uh, in the New York area the way he is, I, I just saw a poll this morning, his approval rating on handling this is in the 80s. Uh, there's some suggestion that, you know, wouldn't he have been a better candidate for the Democrats than Joe Biden? I, I saw the New York Times uh, editorial to that effect yesterday. What, what do you make of that kind of talk? Well, one of the reasons his uh, numbers are high on handling it is because of the federal government, because we give him ships and we give him ventilators and we give him all of the things that we're giving him, Steve. And, you know, we're giving him a hospital. We're giving him four hospitals and four medical centers and all of the things that we've done. So, I mean, one of the things that I think he'd admit this, one of the reasons he's been successful, if I said, no, we're not giving you four hospitals, that we're not giving you four medical centers, that we're not sending you a ship, that he's got a whole, and we didn't give them thousands of ventilators, by the way, and millions of masks, because we've sent them a lot of stuff. Well, one of the reasons he's successful is because we've helped make him successful. Now, if he's going to run, that's fine. I wouldn't mind running against Andrew. I, understand, I know Andrew for a long time. I wouldn't mind that. But I'll be honest, I think he'd be a better candidate than uh, Sleepy Joe. Uh, I wouldn't mind running against Andrew. I don't mind running against Joe Biden. I, I watch these critiques of me, uh, and they're highly sophisticated critiques. I said, you know, where they're written out. Uh, Joe Biden has said, and then they put this very highly sophisticated statement out. I said, Joe Biden didn't write that statement, and Joe Biden doesn't even, I guarantee he didn't even see that statement. So, no, I think probably Andrew would be better. I'm telling you right now, you know, I want somebody at this country that, that's going to do a great job. And I hope I'm going to win, and the polls say I'm going to win. Now it's every poll says I'm going to win because, you know, you say he's gotten good marks, but I've gotten great marks on what we've done with respect to this. I've gotten great marks, and even from almost every Democrat governor. So I've gotten great marks also. But uh, we want to always make sure that we have a great president. We have somebody that's capable. I personally don't Mr. think president, Joe Biden's yeah. uh, capable. We'll see what happens. You know, I wish him luck. Um, and he's going to be giving statements from his basement uh, studio. But let's talk about the $2.2 trillion uh, uh, bill that you just signed into law Friday that's going to help everybody out. What I found is coming out so consistently from people in all walks, from working class to upper class, is the, the, uh, how um, distasteful it is, the crap they piled in there. Uh, for example, the $25 million for the Kennedy you. Center. But do you know, Mr. Yeah, President, hours you, after they got it? You know, no, I know, and I know they jammed it down your throat, but do you know hours after they got that, they, after they got their money, they told 100-plus of their musicians that their last paycheck will be on Friday. So no, they I get know, the grant, and they're still getting rid of the people. How, does it, how can this stand? Because this is the Democrats. It's the way they play. So just so you understand, you do understand, all of you, but your audience, maybe most of them understand it, too, I suspect. We need their votes. We have to get their votes. They have the House. If we don't get their votes, we can't do it. So they have the House. So they come into us at the last minute, Pelosi. We actually had a deal done with Schumer and everybody, and it was a, you know, really a much better, visually a much better deal. Look, the big picture is we have $2.2 trillion, and it can go up further because we're going to help Boeing, and we're going to help the airlines, and we're going to help a lot of great companies and everything stay. Because, you know, companies that were in great shape three weeks ago all of a sudden are you know, struggling for survival. These are companies that never thought about survival. What happened is the Democrats come to us with Pelosi and her group, her, her super radical left group. They come to us and they want all sorts of things. We want to change the voting laws. We want to change uh, this. We want windmills all over the place to ruin uh, everybody's house and farm. We want to do all sorts of things. And radical left, we want the Green New Deal. They wanted the Green New Deal. They didn't even know how to define it. I said, how do you define the Green New Deal? They had no idea how to define it. I said, which aspect do you want? No more cows? What do you want? No more airplanes? No more flying? That you shouldn't be approving because we're going to save the airlines. So we're going to save the airline in this, uh, in this bill, but you want the Green New Deal, which says you can't fly anymore. One car to a house and it has to be electric? I mean, these people wanted everything. They wanted things that were so ridiculous and had nothing to do with putting people to just essentially lost their jobs, putting them back to work. 
So it's a disgrace. Now, if we don't approve it, then you don't get your deal. And we walked and we did everything you have to do. And we cut them down. By the way, if you would have seen this uh, a week before we signed it, you wouldn't have believed it. And that's why it took an extra week. We wasted a whole week. And they have something I'll tell you right now on the unemployment and unemployment insurance where they wanted it delivered a certain way. And I said, you'll never get it that way because the machines, it goes to the states and then the states with 40 year old equipment are supposed to send it to people. I said, it's going to be very, very hard for many of the states to send this money because they're getting hit with too much money and they don't have the equipment, the computers to take care of it. Many of them, not all of them. And, but they wanted it sent this way. And I said to the people, they're doing a bad, you know, a bad thing. But when you start reading about it in a week and the people didn't get their money, you're going to see that uh, it was the Democrats that did it. I mean, at least I have to say it before the fact because it'll blow up because I'm right on right. things. You know, that's what I do. So, But we needed their votes, Brian. If we didn't have their votes, we wouldn't have a deal. We had no, to take but, care but of people. But some Republicans, Otherwise, Mr. We President, had had some Republicans. Kentucky even got, uh, L'Oreal got money for sunscreen research in Kentucky. I'm not sure if that's Mitch McConnell related, but it looks like Republicans piled some stuff in, too. Utah got money for a water project? What is that about? Well, when the Democrats do their thing and when they go out and they do things, then the Republicans do things. And we, we had a beautiful, it was beautiful. And then she got involved and she wanted all this nonsense and much of it was nonsense. And some of it's OK, but it doesn't pertain to people that lost their job. And all we do is complicate a bill. And, you know, but money distribution was such a big factor. And, and she's just they're just doing it the wrong way. It's too it's it's compli it's a complicated way of screwing it up and that's what they wanted and that's what they always want they like to see things a mess and they're a mess hey look what's going to happen i think the republicans are going to take back the house when we take back the house keep the senate and keep the presidency you'll see things much different this will never happen but in the meantime they have a majority by you know a number of votes in the house and the one thing with the Democrats, frankly, I think they're lousy politicians because their policies are no good. They want open borders. They want sanctuary cities. They wanted to fund sanctuary cities in this bill. They wanted me to guarantee that we were going to fund sanctuary cities in this bill. We got it out. I mean, there were so many things, but they want all of these, you know, the, the open border policy. Now people don't even fight me on it. I've been fighting, you know, we're up to 161 miles of wall and we'll have 500 miles pretty soon toward the end of the year. Toward the end of the year, we'll have uh, we're getting close to 500 miles of border. It's going to be what a difference. And by the way, the numbers are way down on the border. What a difference the wall makes. So you're at 161. Nobody comes through that area. They can still walk around it. It's a long walk, but nobody comes through the area where we have the wall. It's been and it's going to be a great blessing once it's up. And it's going to be. It's going to be uh, sometime next year. We'll have over 500 miles of wall. It's uh, been an incredible thing. That yeah. was not easy to get. And now they don't fight me on the wall anymore because they know it's a bad subject for them. Politically, it's a very bad subject. And especially since this happened, we now have a strong border. And it's, it's very good. So we needed their votes. So they had to agree to things that I hated to agree to them. But we would have never had the deal. We took a lot right. of them out. Yeah, people are hurting. They need that money. So, Mr. President, we asked, we've been asking throughout the entire show for people to send in their questions for you. They've been pouring in. This is from one of our viewers. His name is Brian. And he says, why are airports still open with millions of people still traveling from hotspot cities? Do you plan to close them? So we're going to be, hopefully, uh, before we close things, we're going to start to open things. We think we're going to be opening things very soon. Airports, when you close them and reopen them, it's a tremendous deal. It's a tremendous deal. In addition, you need them for emergency. You have emergency flights. I know there was a, there was a situation where people were flying down to Florida. And, you know, you're not, we're not putting quarantine. We thought about quarantine. People recommended quarantine a week ago, and we studied it, and I decided not to do it. You know, you can't. We think it's fine. And there's tremendous testing going on also for people going down. They have sometimes there's testing on both ends. But closing it up and reopening them is never easy. You know, it's, uh, it's never very easy, Ainsley. Uh, also, Mr. President, we got an email from a woman by the name of Wendy. She says, as an ER nurse, my coworkers and I are putting our lives and those of our families in direct harm 
from coronavirus patients. Most of us do not qualify for the stimulus bill, and yet our expenses have increased tremendously. Have you considered any type of hazard pay for those of us in direct wow. contact with the virus, Mr. President? So we are looking at that, and we're looking at that as uh, either an amendment or something. But, you know, these are incredible people. I see it uh, just watching. I see it all the time where these people are walking into wards with so many people that are so sick. And, you know, it's like... Uh, and, and the percentage of them having a problem is, is relatively high, even when they have the equipment, they have the good equipment, because they're getting more and more of the good equipment. But these are really brave people. Actually, they're warriors in a true sense. So we are looking at different ways of doing it, primarily through the hospitals, because we're funding hospitals. And uh, these are generally hospitals that she's talking about. So uh, we are doing it through funding, through the funding of hospitals. Uh, we are asking the hospitals to do it and consider something, including bonuses. And I think they're entitled to it. If anybody's entitled to it, they are. Yeah, I love for politicians to fight for them to get money as opposed to some yeah. other force to get money. An email I from agree. Kevin for you, Mr. President. Uh, if there is another relief bill, how can we stop lawmakers from dipping into it again for special interest projects? Man, we were just talking about this. Do you want to expand? Can well, we stop the expand. next one? It's just, it's just the common facts. I mean, they have a majority in the House, and therefore you need their vote, and they want to get certain things. I, I will tell you this. If you look at before and after, the things they had in there were crazy. Uh, they had things, uh, levels of voting that if you ever agreed to it, you'd never have a Republican elected in this country again. They had things in there about, uh, you know, election days and uh, what you do and uh, all sorts of uh, clawbacks, and they had things that were just totally crazy and had nothing to do with workers that lost their jobs which and companies that we have to save. So, uh, look, we got—it's an amazing bill because it gives us great flexibility on saving the workers and saving the companies, and that includes small businesses. You know, massive amounts of money are going to be put into the small biz into small business, and— uh, it's going to help. I, I, look, we want to keep the businesses open. We want to keep the jobs going. But if you would have looked at this bill before and after, you would have seen a tremendous. Uh, we thought we were going to walk away from it. We actually thought we'd have to right. walk away. We did walk away a couple of times, actually. But we thought we were literally going to have to walk away and start all over again. They had so much junk in there, and it was junk. Much of it was junk. All right, Mr. President, this is an email from Anthony. He says, as an essential business, truck drivers, operators are concerned about being exposed as they allow customers into their trucks and their cabs. Are there any discussions about extending masks or other industry, to other industries? Well, they can do that, and some people are doing it. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to do that. It's a very unpleasant thing, walking around with a mask all day. I think truck drivers, it depends. If they're in the cab by themselves, they should be in great shape. You know, a truck driver, if he's in the cab, you got a lot of safety up there. So I don't know what he says people are going into his cab. I'm not exactly sure what kind of a truck that is. But I know a lot about trucks. Uh, Mr. President, uh, speaking of truck drivers and uh, people who work out on the roads, you know, right now, uh, with the price of oil below $20 a barrel because of a price war with producers and the fact that a lot of us simply are not driving the cars anymore, the people in the oil and gas business are really hurting. And I know you have touted energy independence by the United States for a long time, but, you know, they're in, they're in some deep straits right now. Well, you're right, because Russia and Saudi Arabia are fighting, and they've driven down the price of oil. And I never thought I'd be saying that maybe we have to have an oil increase, because uh, we do. The price is so low now, they're fighting like crazy over, over distribution and over how many uh, barrels to let go. And by the way, right after this call, I'm speaking to a gentleman named Vladimir Putin. That's my next call. And in fact, he'll be, uh, he'll be on the phone very shortly. And I'm talking to him about that, among other things. Because, you know, getting along with Russia is a good thing. I used to say it during the campaign. And then these uh, lousy politicians, they said, you know, saying, oh, Russia, Russia, Russia. Well, we have problems with other countries more than Russia, frankly. We have problems with, and potential problems with other countries, too. So, no, I'm speaking to him in a little while. We're going to discuss that. That'll be one of the subjects we're going to be talking about is energy. And, you know, we don't want to have an, an industry that's wiped out. And, by the way, bad for them and bad for, bad for everybody. I don't—this is a fight between 
Saudi Arabia and Russia having to do with how many barrels to let out. And they both went crazy. They both went crazy. Right. And there are a lot of uh, ships Mr. that are doing a lot of business right now. They're storing it in ships all over right. the United Mr. President. Yes. Pardon me. Um, whose idea was the phone call? Uh, and what else are you going to talk to him about? Well, I'm going to talk to him about that. And we're going to talk to him about uh, we talk about trade and we talk about trade a lot. They would love to be able to do trade with our country. You know, it's been very much hindered by the nonsense that's been going on. Russia, 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 uh, which has turned out to be a total hoax. When you look at what happened with Comey and McCabe and uh, you look at all of the, the things that happened with with Mueller and the Mueller report, the whole thing turned out to be a hoax. And it really stops us from getting along with other countries. You know, it's an important country, and we should get along with we should get along with all countries if possible. And by the way, we have the strongest military because of what I've done over the last three years. We have the strongest military in the world. Nobody even comes close. But we should get along with countries because ideally we don't have to use it. We should be able to get along with countries. There's a lot of things that Russia's involved with, that right. China's involved with. And nobody talks to these people. I spoke to President Xi the other night, two nights ago. We had a great conversation, having to do mostly in that case with what we're doing with the virus. And I'll be I'll be speaking because Russia's got a big problem with that too, with the virus. So we'll be talking about that. But uh, well, literally, that's my Mr. next Brent. call. Yeah, I, I know you're not concerned about speaking to people that uh, that have shown to be enemies of our nation. For example, you know, Russia, they earned the right to be sanctioned. They're poisoning people. Uh, you know what they're doing in Eastern Europe, rattling the cages of their former Soviet Union countries. And we know in the Middle East, creating havoc, killing refugees uh, in an indiscriminate fashion, as well as creating havoc uh, in Iraq. But when you talk to Vladimir Putin, he's going to ask you to lift sanctions. And are, what are you going to say when he asks that? I'm the one that put the sanctions on, Brian. Nobody else. I put the sanctions on. Oh, no. I'm the one. I've been tougher on Russia than any president in the history of the country. I put the sanctions on. And uh, they have a lot. Yeah, he'll probably ask that. In the meantime, he's been asking that for two years. So, uh, you know, that's what I do. But uh, I was the one that sanctioned it. He's, they're very heavily sanctioned. They don't like that. And frankly, we should be able to get along. But when you say about uh, lifting sanctions, you make it sound like, uh, gee whiz, I'm the soft guy that came along. Russia got away with murder. Everybody got away with murder against us. China took $500 billion out of our hides for years under Obama and Bush. For years, $500 billion. Now they're paying us billions of dollars. I tariff them. Nobody thought that was even doable. They're paying us hundreds of billions of dollars. So, you know, I know more about sanctions because I'm the one that put them on Russia. And nobody's exposed, no, I, as an example, I, I, I the just pipeline, the I, Russian I just think, pipeline. Right. The I Russian mean, pipeline. Nobody, well, you never Mr. even President. heard of the Russian pipeline until I came along. Um, and no, I'm it's saying, a great idea, this? and the sanctions yeah, are real. But, I mean, but I, that was all me. That was nobody else. No, absolutely, Mr. President. Think about how Venezuela would have turned, Maduro would have been history had they gone out of Venezuela. And they haven't well, moved, they haven't that. budged. I'm not saying they're babies. I'm not saying they're perfect. We might discuss that, too, by the way. I'm not saying they're perfect. But, you know, they also fought World War II. They lost 50 million people. They were our partner in World War II. Germany was the enemy. And Germany is like this wonderful thing. Well, Germany takes advantage of us on trade for years. They pay far too little in NATO. They're paying 1 percent, and they're supposed to pay 2 percent. And nobody talks about that. You know, it's sort of interesting. Uh, uh, if you look at Russia, Russia lost 50 million people at World War II. 50 million. They were fighting along with us. They were our partner. And now we don't talk yeah. to Russia. We talk to Germany. I mean, look, it's fine. I want to talk to Germany. My father was born. You know, Germany is... is it's in my heritage. It might be in your heritage. I'm not saying anything wrong. I'm just saying, how come we talk to some people, we don't talk to others? Where does it go? So, and it is true, as you look, take a look at World War II. Take a look at the staggering losses that they, and they were fighting with us. But then we, we had the Cold War. All right, II. Mr. President.
Mr. President, um, let yeah. me ask you a question that a lot of people are concerned about. I'm getting a lot of uh, text messages from family and friends, and people on Facebook have questions about um, these drugs that you're testing. I know you're in the middle of the trial. Yeah. People are scared, and when you have a loved one that's in the hospital, and many of us do in New York, and they're fighting for their lives, they want to know which drugs are the best. And you're, I know you're looking at these anti-malaria drugs. You're looking at um, remdesivir. There's an HIV and a breast cancer drug that that doctors are, are thinking might help. Which thing Therapy is showing the most promise? Well, first of all, we're going to have a vaccine, I think, within a little bit less than uh, a year. That's good because we're half. worried about a resurgence. Uh, we're doing really very good with the vaccines, but that's not for right now. In the meantime, you have people, and I have friends in the hospital. I have one of them who's uh, got two problems. He's heavy and he's not so young, okay? He's not exactly a youngster. And he's, uh, he's in a coma. He's in a coma. So, you know, this is tough stuff. So we, the hydroxychloroquine is something that I have been pushing very hard. I got the very early approval from the FDA. It was going to take a long time. And Dr. Stephen Hahn, the head of the FDA, gave us a, an early approval, a very quick approval, a 24-hour approval. I mean, it was incredible mm -hmm. because the drug has been used and the other with the Z-Pak, uh, Zipromycin. It's called Z-Pak, Zipromycin, and the combination. And I think it might be successful. Now, here's the only problem. I'll know. I think we're going to have a good idea over the next uh, three days because it's been used now in New York at my request, 1,100 people. It's been used. I think that's better than testing in a laboratory, but, you know, the doctors tell me no. Some doctors tell me no, but whatever it is, it is. And I got it done because I said, look, some of these people are very sick and they're not going to make it. Let's do it. Let's get it done. It's like right to try. I got that approved. Where people are now, that was trying to get approved for 50 years. They couldn't. I got it done. Where people that are terminally ill weren't allowed to use potentially good drugs because they weren't approved. So I, can, I now have it where they can use them. And by the way, the results have been unbelievable. They travel to Asia. They travel to Europe to get drugs. And, you know, we gave them hope. But it's more than hope because these drugs are, in many cases, they've been working and saving lives. It's been a great thing. It's called Right to Try. Well, this is sort of that. Uh, somebody's really sick or dying, and we try this. And w I can tell you it's a big sample, 1,100 people. And uh, let's see what happens. We're going to start knowing about this stuff in the very, very near future. Very near. Well, that's, that sounds very promising. Mr. President, I think uh, I've heard from a lot of my neighbors th that they are, uh, they like to see your press conferences toward the end of the day, just to know where we are in this fight against this invisible evil, uh, as you have referred to it, too. I, I, I'm sure that uh, you have looked at what other presidents have done in times of great challenge like this. You know, with the American people watching right now, what's the one thing I, I heard you say yesterday, we're going to get through this together. What's one thing you want the American people to know about the next month, which starts now? Well, I think it's going to be a month of achievement. I think it's going to be a month where uh, all of the hard work that they've done, because that's hard work, although some people would view it as uh, they really have learned a lot about themselves and their families. But it's hard work to, you know, stay yep. in place, to distance yourself. Nobody's ever heard it. Washing hands a lot is good. I've always washed my hands a lot. But uh, people, some people probably didn't. But washing hands is good. I think a lot of this stuff, by the way, is going to stay with us for the future. Uh, Dr. Fauci uh, told me that if people kept this going, the flu would be much less severe if people would practice the same kind of thing, you know, between the distancing and the washing hands. And, uh, and you know, another one is not shaking hands. I was never a big lover of that. Once I became a politician, you either embrace it or you can get out of politics very quickly because you're not going to do very well. But, you know, it's possible that a custom like that, like in Japan, what they do is a— they nod their head. They do a little bit of that stuff, but uh, but they don't shake hands. And, you know, it's, uh, they were a little ahead of their times. So let's see whether or not that sticks after this is gone. But the big thing is it will be gone. It will be gone hopefully sooner rather than later. And hopefully we will keep the deaths down to the absolute minimum number. There's tremendous death, but we'll keep them down to the minimum number, you know, if— uh, if we didn't do well, the numbers would be many times what they would be the way we're doing it. So that's that's a that's the big thing. I just hope we're going to have a tremendous success. 
And Mr. President, a lot of people, as you mentioned, the families are together for the first time. The college kids are home. The high school kids are home. The grammar school kids are home. The teachers, the family is now doing the homeschooling for the first time. And in, I'm just wondering, you do have a family. You got Barron supposed to be in school and Melania is home. How do they keep themselves occupied in the White House? What, have they been watching Netflix? Have they been watching yeah. Fox Nation solely? Well, Barron's not so unhappy, okay? He's not so unhappy. They said, you can't go to school. And I wouldn't say he's the, uh, I, I wouldn't say he uh, sat up and complained about it. But, you know, we're uh, working with the school, and the school gives uh, lessons uh, through the computers and through every other means they have. They have a lot of different means, and all of those kids where Barron goes, they're, they're you know, learning. That's another thing. I think education is. You know, is I, I think it goes back. I think it, what can be better than being in a school? But uh, education's even changing. When you see uh, meetings are changing, all the teleconferencing. I've done a lot of. I did a G20 and a G7 by teleconference mm -hmm. meetings that we would have met the leaders of countries, and I did it by teleconference. So. It's been uh, it's been a great experience, and uh, the problem is was that you know the result is, uh, and and the thing that we just have to cherish is life. You look at what's going on; it's been just so horrible. It's been so horrible to see it. I've never seen. You know, I grew up near Elmhurst, and I look at Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, and I've known it. You know, I could tell you all about it. I could tell you what it looks like, what color it is, and Elmhurst Hospital in Queens is like a, a literally a big source. It's terrible what's going on. It's uh, body bags all over. They're bringing in refrigerator trucks to put the bodies in, refrigerated trucks, big vans, uh, big trucks are coming in. Uh, yeah. No, it's a, very, uh, it's a very sad thing. But we're going to beat it, right. and we're getting much closer than further. And everybody's done an incredible job, and we're going to have a victory. And you have, don't forget, we have 151 countries out there that are going through the same thing. But yep. they don't have, in many cases, they don't have money, and they don't have things that we have. We had the greatest economy in history, and all of a sudden, one day, they said, everybody has to stop. Nobody can go to work. We have to stop. And we think of this. We're paying people not to go to work. It was always the opposite. We pay people to work. Now we're paying people not to go to work. And we'll with that, I have to go we'll to work, too. Well, Mr. President, to to before you leave, one Make last question. How, could I ask you one last question? How can we pray yes. for you? Well, I would love that. I would love to uh, say how the evangelical community, the Christian community, and really communities of faith, for the most part, have really been on my side. You saw that in the last election. And I think you'll see it even more so in this election. But when people say that to me, it's always a great honor, Ainsley. I know how you feel, and uh, I, it's always a great honor. And well, I really, the Bible really is do clear. We need to it. pray for our leaders, and we are praying for you. Many in this country are clinging to God right now. So thank you, Mr. President, and thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you very much, Ainsley. And thank yeah, you, Steve thank you, and President. Brian. I appreciate it. And uh, it's great, great being with you always. It's like, it's like the old times, but this is a serious deal, and uh, we'll get it taken care of. We will, we will win. And it'll be fairly soon. Yes. And we'll that get is what people want to hear. All right, again. Mr. President, thank you very much. Thank Good luck all. on that phone thank call you. with uh, Mr. Putin. All right. Yeah.